Here we go. You're listening to the show on WNHHLP 103.5 FM, broadcasting live from downtown New Haven. We're streaming live on TuneIn Radio and the New Haven Independent.org. We're also streaming live video on Facebook Live. All you have to do is go to facebook.com slash New Haven Independent or just go to your own Facebook page and look us up. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Michelle Turner. I have the pleasure of being its host. We are, again, 103.5 FM, newhavenindependent.org, WNHH. And I, right off the bat, have broken one of my New Year's resolutions, New Year's resolutions. And I was going to say, nah, you don't want to know what it is, but I should tell you anyway, because it has to do with why I'm sitting here in this chair by myself without a guest. So one of my New Year's resolutions was to make sure I had guests lined up for the quarter. And I had been working on some things, you know, and I did get some people, although it didn't quite work the way that I wanted. So I'm a little backlogged in trying to reach out to people. But that was my first resolution that I was going to come into this month, come into this quarter with wonderful, fantastic guests. Instead, you got me. (laughs) But I will say that Carrie Ellington last week, I appreciated her so giving her time, even though it was a half hour. Sometimes things always don't work in radio, in podcast, in broadcasting the way that you want them to. And sometimes guests don't always have the time, but are willing to donate what time they have. I've learned that over the years. And so it was cool that she came in and talked about what the organization did and how they pushed for the civilian review board to go through so i was very pleased because i learned some things there were things i knew but i also learned some stuff so that's always good it's always good to learn things okay so what did i do this weekend well you know of course it was founders day weekend for the women the sorors of delta sigma theta sorority incorporated we are 106 years old And we turned that on Sunday, the 13th. The 12th, I had the opportunity to hang out with the squad a little bit. Well, a lot. I won't fib. A lot. We sat in our spot at Amoy's. And we heard the beautiful saxophone music of Fred Nobles. And forgive me, it's not to my head or my heart. I just don't remember in this moment, I'm not going to charge it to either one of those, but in this moment, I can't remember the name of the keyboardist, but he was fantastic as well. And of course, as usual, you know, Amoy's food is always on point. Amoy's cornbread, I could have that by myself all day and I'll gladly take on the 15 pounds that it adds to my thighs. (laughs) Because I love her cornbread and her catfish is fantastic. You know, mac and cheese, fabulous. Just a good place to have some real soul food, comfort food, if you will. Had a very good time with the squad. We sat in our corner and listened to music and chewed and chatted it up. Had some wine, had some wine, had some wine. (laughs) But it's all good, though. And I got home early enough where I could get a good night's sleep. And then on Sunday, I got up and celebrated the fact that 22 women decided they wanted to deal in public service. And their first act of, I don't want to say rebellion, but their first public service act was to march in the women's suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in March of the year of our founding, 1913. And Delta Sigma Theta since then has always been about serving the community with a deep purpose 
of not only scholarship, asking young women to become scholars and leaders, but also working diligently in the community, uh, politically, uh, socially, social action, um, physical, and just really doing the work that black women do in our respective communities. I want to say happy Founders Day to the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Their day was the 15th, Dr. King's real birthday. And it is my understanding that the ladies of Zeta Phi Beta are also celebrating their anniversary today. So a happy Founders Day to you both. Back up earlier in the month, the gentleman of Cap Alpha Psi, in which I have a vested interest as my dad and my nephew are noobs. Um, so a happy Founders Day to them as well. And the reason why, you know, again, it's important to recognize these black letter Greek organizations is because they do so much work in the community. And part of it is we do it in silence. The organizations or the partners that we work with in conjunction to getting things done, um, we work together and we sort of talk about it, but not really. Primarily because it's about the community and it's not about us beating our chest saying, you know, this is what we do and this is how we do it. No, we have a real commitment to our communities and it's a lifetime commitment. So, Happy Founders Day to all the Greeks celebrating this month. So, in celebration of the month, on, I believe, Saturday night, going into Sunday morning, I received a text that my baby, my radio station, I call it mine because I, again, this is something I have a vested interest in, um, that I helped grow, that I helped shape with a fantastic team of people, is going dark in June. AM 1220 WQUN was the place where I got to fly a little bit. I was a single mom. I had worked at WELI probably five years and my baby was due in January and I was looking for work. So I see an ad in the register. Ha, how far back does that go, right? An ad, an actual ad in the register without going into the internet and look for a job, the interwebs. I saw an ad looking for announcers for a radio station. And they even talked about shifts being from one to six or one to six and then six to midnight or something. And I said, well, I won't be working the midnight shift, but certainly I'm going to try to give myself the opportunity to go in and talk about working the day shift. And that's what I did. And at that time, Ray Andrewson and Michael Collins were assistant GM and GM respectively. I had an hour and 45 minute interview with them downstairs in the polling Institute, because at that time the radio station was located upstairs over the polling Institute, um, across from what is now the communications center. But back then it was the law school and Mike made this statement we were talking about newspapers and he was kind of testing my knowledge of newspapers and he kind of yells out well when you come work for us you can have any newspaper you'd like and i sat there stunned because i really truly did not expect to hear anything about me being hired in that moment and I was, and that was one of the best places for me because it allowed me 
to rise in management. I was molded as a manager. Um, I got to try my ideas. I got the support of my bosses. It was very rare that we disagreed on anything because we were very community oriented. And in doing so, there were a lot of stories that got covered that were not being covered by mainstream media at that time. And so when the first AP awards came around for WQUN, my boss said, put a couple of stories in, see what will happen. Now, the, so the Associated Press gives regional awards annually to stations that really not only have quality news, but thoughtful stories, uh, good sound, clarity in explaining, you know, what the idea of the story is, the facts, um, and making it newsworthy. And so on our first try, we won, I believe, two or three Associated Press Awards because we were so small and we, you know, our staff was basically interns, students, me. Um, later on, the man that mentored me, John DeAndre, and uh, Daria Albinger and I worked there together. Daria is now a voice that you will hear doing uh, voiceover packages for ABC News. She works at ABC Radio as well. But I worked with some fabulous people, and there we were. We were the little station that could. Our first year, we had Associated Press Awards, and we went on to win. I mean, there's a wall at WQUN that is covered with Associated Press Awards. And I had the luxury of being the first voice that actually was heard on that air because QUN, when it opens up in the mornings, does news. And then you start to hear the Ray Andrewson morning show. And of course, it's taken on in 22 years, very many different parameters. The station moved, you know, our family underneath us, the Quinnipiac Pole, moved up the street into a fabulous overlooking Whitney Avenue type building. And QUN is located on Whitney Avenue as well. Very nice digs. Um, Mike Collins has since passed on and he's at that big broadcast station in the sky, as is Lou Adler, who I had the pleasure of knowing and being criticized by. <laughs> Lou is considered the father of News Radio 880 in New York City. And he is one of the people who worked with Fred Morrow. He was a Morrow guy. And, um, well, Fred Friendly. Let me back up. Let me get it right. Fred Friendly was one of the Morrow boys. Ed Morrow, the great CBS broadcaster, um, had a cadre of reporters that he shaped. And so one of those folks was his producer named Fred Friendly. And Quinnipiac gives out an annual Fred Friendly Award to different journalists who have you know, pushed the envelope and kind of broken the traditional mold of broadcasting and being journalist. And Lou Adler worked very closely with Fred Friendly. And so one of the joys, if you will, of being a broadcaster is that when you finish Nine times out of ten, at some point in the week or during the day, depending on the size of the organization, you have to sit in a room and listen to your broadcast with your boss. Not always a pleasant ordeal. Not a, and that's what it is, is an ordeal. And so they're called air checks. And I got air checked by Lou Adler. And when I tell you that my stomach would always hit the floor before that door got closed and we listened to my broadcasts. Ugh. 
It, it gives me chills even now, <laughs> 20 something years later. But one day he said to me, Michelle, you can't make the small mistakes. If you make the small mistakes, they're going to take you right off the air in New York. And I looked at him and I'm like thinking to myself, so I'm good enough to be in New York on the air. Then one day he walked into the station and planted a kiss on my forehead. Of course, now that wouldn't be acceptable, but planted a kiss on my forehead. And he said, you got it. You're doing it. You done it and walked away. And that for me was more important than any award I could have been given because Lou Adler told me that I was better than good. So QUN holds a lot of memories for me. Um, I made Charles Osgood laugh. There was a headline (laughs) in the inner city newspaper that said, Ed McMahon comes to Quinnipiac, meets Michelle Turner. That to me was the funniest thing because it made it sound like the only reason why he came to Quinnipiac was to meet me. And I did meet Ed McMahon, um, the McMahon Center at Quinnipiac Broadcasting is named after him. So at that time, then President Leahy would bring all of the important guests over to the radio station and we would have a chance to sit and chat. So I got to meet him. I got to meet Charles Osgood. Uh, Mickey Carroll, who was part of the Kennedy administration, believe it or not, and worked at the New York Times for many, many, many years, was part, an instrumental part of the polling institute when it first opened. So it was always cool to sit with Mickey Carroll and hear stories about Jack Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, and the underlying stories of what we don't know in those moments, in those hours. So QUN for me has a very special, special spot. In addition, you know, they let me bring my daughter to work. My daughter is the same age as the station. So she used to have a pop-up playpen there and she would run through the station like nobody's business and everybody got to the point where they would say, hi Mia, hi Mia, hi Mia. You got used to her being there. When she was very small and in a car seat, I can tell you that my boss, Lynn Bushnell, picked the kid up and took her outside and comforted her while I was on the air. So Nancy Falcone, Ray Andrewson, Greg Little, Daria Alvinger, Mike Collins, You have to think about it, you know, because there's so many people and my media babies who've gone on and done great things. Great, great, great things. I'm so proud of those kids that I had the opportunity to work with and teach how to write um, at WQUN. It's a community jewel. And I hope that the university in some way tries to reconsider um bringing that back to life, maybe under different call letters, maybe they sell it to somebody and somebody runs P NPR and has local news, but it would be a shame for that station to go dark as much good as it brings to the greater new Haven community, because that was always its purpose to highlight the greater new Haven community and bring good, solid, clear and concise news. Mike Collins was a stickler for that. So Kudos to QUN and it's 22 years and hopefully it'll be around for another 22 in some way, shape or form. My understanding is that the university is shuttering it because students no longer want to be interested in radio. They have no interest. We'll see how long that lasts because there are things called podcasts, which like I'm doing right now. So, um, Again, kudos to QUN and I'll post a little something later on because I really want the kids that I worked with who are now adults, uh, how want them to know how proud I am of them. And, you know, we we made it work. We did the right thing and we made it work. 
And my media babies are doing very well in the media world. So my Eagles lost. I can't have Tony on to talk about it. We're going to have to do things from a different standpoint, different venue, because he's not available during the hours that the show runs. So I'm going to have to bring Tony McLean in at some point and record him and play it back because there's a lot going on as far as sports. Um, and there's a lot going on with NFL. Not to mention Super Bowl's coming up. And I believe Adam Levine is doing the Super Bowl show, the halftime show. I don't think anybody, people care, but I don't think people care that Adam Levine is doing it. <laughs> I really don't. I, I just think that they, they don't care he's doing it. But we'll see. We'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks and, you know, what people's reactions will be to he and a couple of other performers doing the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the halftime show at this year's Super Bowl. So did you or did you not watch Surviving R. Kelly? I will tell you, and I'm not going to go into how I personally feel about R. Kelly and what he has done. Uh, but I will say that um, the special is very riveting, um, shocking, and I think it leaves you with questions. I think it leaves you with questions as to why these women have never been taken seriously or why these women have not been heard outside of a courtroom before there is a music critic in Chicago, I believe he writes for the Tribune, and he has been following the R. Kelly court cases and suits since I believe the mid to late 90s. And he has phone calls, texts, he gets emails from people saying, that they too have been affected by R. Kelly. So I can't remember his name at the moment, but he's a, a critic for music critic for the Chicago Tribune. So, and I believe his first name is Joe. Can't remember his last name. If I remember, I'll tell you next week. Um, but he's been tracking this from the very, very beginning. And he's had some interesting things to say about R. Kelly and why he thinks this whole thing has basically missed mainstream media, even though most people did in the late 90s, maybe it was even early 2000s, uh, by the videotape. Somebody went and made a videotape of R. Kelly allegedly R. Kelly, as they say, having sex with a young woman. And Dave Chappelle even did a skit. So, um, surviving R. Kelly is something that I think most people need to watch and reflect on. So, I really do want to have some folks in the studio to talk about where journalism is, what is what it, where it is going, what it is doing, um, and also monetary capitalism. I've been listening to NPR, listen to NPR at work because I can't stand the silence and all the babble. I need something to kind of like be in my my head other than what I'm hearing. And um, there was. A woman on one of the programs yesterday who said what the future is going to entail is that there are different places that are going to charge you fees for your information. And then you can go ahead and do what you like. Unlike 
social media outlets that have been taking your information and giving it to other people. And it's because you might sign a little agreement saying, oh, I got cookies or, oh, this is here. And you don't realize that you're giving away your information. She gave the example of people driving Ford cars or trucks and how people could pay for that. And then, you know, sort of like a zip car service. But then Ford gathers all this information about you as you're using their car, like where you went, what radio station or what podcast you listen to, um, how many miles you traveled to the grocery store, how many people were in the car. I mean, by the time you get out of that car, Ford will have a good thumbnail snapshot, if you will, of your life or a day in the life of. And she's saying that that is starting to happen. So what do you think about that? Is that good? Is that bad? Is that something that um, you would mind? I think I mind it because I'm really concerned about my privacy these days as far as, you know, what I read, what I don't read, where I go, who I go with. I think if I'm willing to tell you that, that's one thing, but for you to constantly monitor my behavior, my habits, and what I do and what I don't do, that to me is scary. And it, it all becomes part of a monetary system that will continue to grow. And I'm not so sure if people are aware of that. And it's something you really need to look into, something you can really, really uh, learn a lot about. I certainly will be learning a lot about that over the next couple of days because I'm very intrigued by it. I have been writing a lot. I am applying for a John F. Knight Fellowship at Stanford University. And I've always been intrigued by this fellowship because of what it allows you to do. So, runs a little something like this. They take in probably 30, 25 to 30 people. Some from outside of the United States, some from inside the United States. So it's domestic and international journalists. And you have the opportunity to present an idea, study that idea, and try to make that idea a reality. So I'm intrigued by that. And I want to see how far I can get this time. Um, the last time I tried to apply for it was probably 10 years ago. And I didn't make it. But they did say to me that they were a little bit more interested in hearing my ideas. And I could ask for someone to help me write. And so I did. I got uh, a former fellow out of the Oakland area who was very, very good. And she really helped me kind of trim down my my ideas and be a little bit more specific and get to the point. So I don't have anybody like that this time <laughs> around. <laughs> but I'm spending a lot of time writing and thinking about what it is I want to do. Um I'm very intrigued by news deserts that are around the country, particularly in black and brown communities. Now, my good friend Babs and I have had this discussion because she feels like Facebook is it, that it takes care of that desert, that somebody can pick up a phone or whatever medium you use and basically communicate what's going on. I say that's social because you don't have necessarily the parameters in place of traditional journalism, but she seems to feel that you don't need them because you're still getting information out to communities that may not use traditional media anyway to get people's stories out. So people are 
owning their stories. And I don't have a problem with people owning their stories. Heck, I'm sitting up here talking to you now out of the blue. So this is my story for the day. <laughs> but um, as as someone who has been a journalist for a long time, and even though I'm not doing as much journalistic work as I used to, uh, my soul is still a journalist. So I'm sort of a traditionalist in that sense in um, the parameters need to go by a certain way, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And um, while social media is great because it's great to see stuff in the moment, I think sometimes it also lends itself to being hacked. So you get into this thing of what is true and what's not. And there's also the argument about that as well, because the first newspapers were really promotional pieces. They weren't about necessarily telling both sides of the story. They were really about telling somebody's story, but it wasn't necessarily the everyday man. It was a business or if it, it was a mogul or it was someone's opinion piece to influence others. Whereas as time went on, it became about the facts. And now we know that we've had Russian interference on the Internet by everybody. Everybody's talked about it over the past year. So what is truth? What 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 does truth look like in print? And how do you know that something's true? Those are the real challenges right now in journalism hey dallas davis thank you so much for listening mr british virgin islands tell you boy dallas gets it in i i can only live vicariously through his facebook page hey harry thank you so much for being patient with me um these past couple of weeks because i have just been buried by work and other things going on around me around my life so i have not gotten the opportunity to really bring a guest in but i'm i'm gonna be better i promise i'm gonna be better i'm gonna bring some people in um you're listening to the show on wnhhlp 103.5 fm broadcasting live from downtown new haven we're streaming live on tune in radio and newhavenindependent.org we're also streaming live video on Facebook Live. Just go to facebook.com slash New Haven Independent, or all you have to do is go to your own Facebook page and look us up. Say hello to my fellow Aggies. Say hello to my cousin Nadine, who's listening. I feel like I'm, hey, mom. I tried to get my mom to come on the air. She's like, I'm not prepared for that. So I'm like, okay, mom. So I'll, I'll give her plenty of time because I think my mom has a real interesting story to tell. Not just because she's my mom, but my mom finished high school at a very early age and went to college. And uh, my mom is also the first woman to be inducted into the Mississippi Valley State Basketball Hall of Fame. Yes, she is. So she has a story to tell, and I want her to come on and tell it. Speaking of HBCUs, the gentleman that is in If Beale Street Can Talk is a Fayetteville State graduate. You've probably seen the videos. It has gone viral. He and the gentleman that played in uh, The Hangover, both have North Carolina A&T in common. As it turns out, the Asian gentleman's father was a professor at A&T for 30 years who taught economics. And the gentleman from If Beale Street Could Talk is a Fayetteville State graduate. But they both talked about A&T on the James Corden show. And it's gone viral. And the gentleman from If Beale Street Could Talk is also a Yale drama grad. So he was talking about how when he was at Fayetteville State, 
he would come to A&T and party. And he's like, it's just lit. They call it Jiho, the greatest homecoming on earth. Now, before all y'all Howard grads and Hampton grads and whoever else that's in the HBCU dysphoria, don't get upset. I'm just telling a story. <laughs> that's all. I'm just telling a story. Of course, I think my homecoming is the best. I think my homecoming is lit. It is every year for everybody that steps foot on the campus. And really and truly, you know, when you when you walk up that hill and you see all those brown people celebrating each other, celebrating the fact that we're A&T grads, although I'm sure a lot of the people who come like that gentleman are not. But just the fact to be there and to be in in a loving atmosphere where nobody's trying to harm anybody, you know, and it's all about having a good time and seeing folks that you haven't seen in a while. You know, that's what makes it for me lit. Now, you know, of course the parties are always off the chain because it's A and T all parties have always been off the chain. Listen, back in my day, how many people could have parliament funkadelic in their gym? I'm just saying. So, you know, that, that means a lot. A&T will always be dear to me. I chose it out of a book, a book, no internet, chose it sight unseen. I knew that one of my uncles had gone there and that was it. And he was pulled out because he got drafted to go into World War II. So he didn't finish A&T. And there is a Crosby Hall and I am a Crosby descendant. So might pay off to do a little bit of um, investigation on that end but yet and still I love a and and raised me so to speak brought me into adulthood um, I got a degree but I also got an education and the bonds that I have with the ladies of the dormitory that I lived in Holland Hall will never ever be broken so it was just a pleasure to hear somebody else testify as to how lit our homecoming is. That's always good. So there are two plays coming to Long Wharf. And Ife Michelle Gardin is going to do a talk sometime in the near future. Um, I hope, I hope, I hope that I can get her back on to talk about Miller, Mississippi because there are always, you know, Black History Month is when everybody decides to open up their hearts and minds to the African-American experience. And so Long Wharf has this play and it will be interesting to see where it leads as far as talking about discussing being in Mississippi at the dawn of the civil rights movement. And speaking of which, Dr. King's birthday was yesterday. And there are always discussions in our community about how his holiday has taken on another realm, i.e. been whitewashed. And I agree with that because I see pictures of Dr. King and thought I hear in nauseam that I have a dream speech. And Dr. King was more than that. He was about trying to unite people. But at the same time, he was also about liberation of black people in this country and letting us have a voice and being treated as real citizens of the United States. And people kind of forget that. So when King day comes or when his birthday, when his first birthday arrives, I usually post a picture that wouldn't be typically seen of Dr. King in particular situations because 
I find that on King Day, it's either this, the picture of him at the Washington Monument uh, giving the I Have a Dream speech, you know, in different variations, paintings, photographs, little kids' drawings, all kinds of stuff, right? But nobody ever posts the pictures of him being arrested or nobody posts the pictures of him being beaten or nobody posts the pictures of him dressed coming out of Birmingham jail where he wrote his, his prophetic letters, which eventually turned into a book. Because I think that most people want to remember something else, something different. And I don't know what that could be because there are people like me who will always tell the stories of, of watching kids on TV being hosed, fire hosed, because they want people to be registered to vote or dogs being sicked on them. I left a profound mark in my mind as a little kid. I mean, you, you, I think you'll have one or two reactions when you first see something like that. Either you're going to be scared to death or you're going to be very determined to vote no matter what it takes. And I think that was the direction that took me in because I could not imagine as a little kid why somebody would sick a dog on me because I wanted to vote. Even though I didn't fully understand what voting was, I knew it didn't have anything to do with fighting somebody or anything violent. So I couldn't understand the violent reaction to that. So I, I always post on Dr. King's birthday, the picture I posted this time around, it almost actually looks like a selfie, which kind of makes me sniggle a little bit, but it's Dr. King in front of a whole line of officers holding billy clubs and having helmets on. So I don't know who else was with Dr. King, but that picture to me is very profound because that shows exactly what he was up against every time he went somewhere. And it didn't necessarily always mean the South. I believe he was stabbed in Chicago because he was trying to get fair housing, decent housing. So I want people to think of Dr. King for who he was and not necessarily this version or not this version, period. Not even not necessarily, just not this version that is out there of Dr. King as a person who um, gave a speech. Or my favorite is he's the organizer of the March on Washington. He is not. That was put together by Bayard Rustin and Ralph Bunch and a couple of other people who really wanted to um, have the idea, express the freedom of marching for jobs. The March on Washington was a march for jobs and economic development in our community, in the African-American community. It was about jobs. It was about economics. It wasn't about Dr. King's speech. There were a litany of speakers that day. And Bayard Rustin really pulled something off without fax machines, without the internet, even without letters. He was doing things by phone. He did the mimeograph. I know I'm aging myself when I say that. But he did things through flyers and yes, some letters, but basically it was phone and letters. And he pulled together unions. He pulled together the Hollywood community. He pulled together the average Joe and Joan. And they all went together to the Washington Monument to make sure that the president heard a message. It wasn't 
just Dr. King saying, I have a dream. So I hope that you will remember that and do your own research. Do your own research on things, people. You know, just because you see something in print doesn't mean it's true. And even if it is, still do your own research. Don't just believe what you see and hear. That's what gets you in trouble. And that also leads to a lot of ignorance on either side of the fence. Read something. Research something. If you don't read well, listen to it. There's audio now. But just don't believe everything you see or read. Do your own investigation. Think about things. So, last but not least, I think the biggest thing for me this year is that I really do want to travel. And there are a couple of places on the list. My sorority is in New Orleans this year. I've never been to New Orleans. Well, I can't say that I haven't been. Um, I was just passing through, so I didn't get the opportunity to really spend some time in New Orleans. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I may end up at the Kentucky Derby. We'll see about that. I'm not sure yet. Um, family members are interested in the trip. I don't know where I'm getting all this money because all of this costs money, right? So I got to figure that out. But Kentucky Derby, New Orleans, and of course, homecoming. I will be going to homecoming until my daughter can no longer push me in a wheelchair to go. <laughs> I'm sure she's real appreciative of that, learning about that through this medium. But she's heard me say it before, so it's not a big deal. Um, but I'm I'm really truly gonna do some domestic traveling, and I'm interested in doing some international traveling, because in about another two years, I don't know if I'll be living in the United States. Two three years from now, maybe in another country, another continent. Because I think for me, I am in need of new experiences. I, I want to see other things. And you know what? As much as I love my family, I am not in love with this Connecticut weather at this time of year. I'm just not. And supposedly because of the polar vortex splitting into threes, we are going to have one heck of a winter. So I just, I can't do it anymore. I can't do the winters. And I never liked winter. And I finally figured out why. Because as a kid, I'm old enough to remember we could not go to school in pants. And somebody said, yes, we could. I'm like, girl, you are not as old as I am. (laughs) You're just not. Because we could not. We had to wear thick heavy tights or thick heavy socks and we had to wear skirts to school and while we had coats it was still cold nobody was closing school back then for 15 and 20 degree weather and yes I did honestly walk uphill to school when I was discovering that I did not like winter time and it's always stayed with me so I am I am suggesting to everybody that over the next couple of weeks, get your oil tank straight, get some oil in your house if that's what you need, put a little bit of extra money aside to pay for your heat if you have gas, make sure your freezer is stocked, make sure your refrigerator is stocked, make sure you got some dry goods just in case you no longer have power because we are in for a big one. That is my understanding. So just know that in another two years, three years, this will be a split year for me. I will be on my way somewhere else. So winter will be over for me. I am tired of shoveling my car out 
tired of shoveling my steps, tired of shoveling my sidewalk. I've had it. So it's time for me to go. And speaking of which, it's just about time for me to leave. Harry has given me the bat signal. But I will say this. I promise you that next week and the weeks thereafter, I will have guests. Because me talking, eh, it's too much. But yet and still, I have a commitment. So I'm here. All right. So be sure that you check out Miller, Mississippi. Um, oh, storytellers at um, Concat the other night was very good as well. Hats off to Karen and Kevin Walton for bringing this to our community over the past year. It's really been fun. It's really been interesting to hear people's stories and um, get another slice of who lives in New Haven outside of um, my usual group of folks. So, and again, happy Founders Day to all of the Divine Nine. Shout out to Community Baptist Church and Sora Jamie Holmes and the pastor there. I can't remember his name at the moment. I am like beat tired. So please don't hold it against me. Um, but we had a very good time, as they say in the Lord. And the service was fabulous. So shout out to Community Baptist for letting us come in and shower their church in red. We had a wonderful time and the food was good too. So with that, you have been listening to the show on WNHHLP 103.5 FM LP broadcasting live from downtown New Haven. We're streaming live on TuneIn Radio and NewHavenIndependent.org. We're also streaming live video on Facebook Live. Just go to Facebook.com slash New Haven Independent or just go to your own Facebook page and look us up. In addition, I am going to start listening to podcasts. That's my other New Year's resolution. My nephew, Julius Collins, has a podcast called The Verdict because he's an attorney and he and two other attorneys out of the greater Atlanta, Georgia area do a podcast on the law and it's quite fun and quite interesting so you should check him out too all right y'all this is it harry i'm done